Great. Well, thanks, for, thanks for having me, Jeff. Thanks for inviting me along. Um, it's great to be here and, and kind of, you know, have a chat with, with people like-minded, very keen about the ag industry and, and tech and, and bringing those two together. I think it's... Um, I think it's an exciting time and, and obviously that's what, what fires me up and um, it's definitely good to see a bit of trend happening in, in the right direction. So um, yeah, just going to go through a bit about what AgWeb is, um, a little bit on our journey and, and then really just you know make it pretty informal and, and, and open it up to any questions that, that people might have. Um, but as Jeff said, you know, AgWeb is a farm management software company. We um, you know, are a startup in, in the true sense approaching it very differently on the basis that, you know, we kind of are going after capital, injecting that, um, trying to grow rapidly, penetrate the market, uh, be a little disruptive along the way if possible, um, and, and approaching, you know, a, a sector of the market. We, we focus on the livestock industry um, as we believe that that area is one that hasn't had technology and innovation um, compared to other, I guess, parts of, of the ag industry. And to think that, you know, 90% of, of farmers out there still use this as their primary kind of record keeping device, which also turns into their business decision making tool, is quite staggering. When you think about everyone out there has got one of these in their pocket. So, you know, there's no reason why people shouldn't be kind of using this as a tool and then, and then using some other, um, I guess, things available to them to kind of build that into a separate platform. <coughs> like other industries in, in the world and, and we believe that one way of, of kind of shifting the dial in terms of you know production efficiencies and profitability is through is through data, is through on farm data. So that's exactly what we've what we've done. We've gone and built a you know farm management app which collects um, you know in the simple term records. It's a record keeping device but it then turns into a farm management tool with the vision that you know, we're not just trying to build a better mousetrap here. We're actually trying to build a platform that pulls in every every aspect of the farmer's business, which can then facilitate data-driven decision making. So that's really that's really what drives us and, and fires us up, um, and, and that's where we see the opportunity. And, and then being involved in you know the entire kind of supply chain um, along the way as well. So uh, just to kind of give you a bit of a background on on my sort of upbringing. So I um, grew up in northern South Australia on a, um, on a pastoral property up there. Um, so my family's been involved in, in livestock production for about five generations. And growing up, I've sort of always been very interested in, in tech. I don't have a tech background myself, but, but always been interested in, in tech and asking the questions of, well, Dad, why are we doing that? And generally, the answer, which is quite common around Australian farmers, um, is, well, that's the way we've always done it, or you know, the finger in the wind type of decision making. Um, coupled with sort of hardware out there, you know, I mean, for us, we're on 400,000 acres, so to check waters, it's a two day water run, it's a two day drive. Um, so why aren't there remote water monitoring systems that are affordable? You know, why aren't there other tools available to actually help with this industry? Um, so, you know, not only on the software side, but the hardware side, and you know, I was sort of looking around for tools from early age saying, well, how can we do this better? Invariably, there wasn't much around that, that could facilitate that. Um, and, and if I look at sort of where we moved in, in our kind of, in our family business, I guess, you know, when my grandpa bought the current place in 52, we had a staff of 25 with 40 horses and a couple of outstations and mustering a paddock would, would take a month. Um, and then, you know, within the sort of the 70s, the motorbikes came in, which then reduced the, the, the staff numbers to, to you know, maybe five, five or seven. Uh, and then, you know, when the, the, the aeroplane came in, the Cessna, you know, what then took a week, you know, now takes two hours and, and mum and dad are running the place on their own. But really, if you look at sort of where that came in in the sort of 70s, 80s, to now in the last 30 years, there hasn't been that step change in, in innovation. Now, sure, we've made different decisions to kind of diversify and, and stay alive as, as every progressive business would do, but in terms of technology, there hasn't been that, that shift. Um, and, and we believe that next shift is, is through data, is through on-farm data, and using that to make data good decisions for the producer, and then allowing uh, that, that information to go, to go across sectors to actually drive that. Um, 
So that's kind of what, what that's all about. Um, as I say, my background's not in tech. I, um, I studied at, at Adelaide Uni and did six years of, of law and arts, became a lawyer, which was, um, you know, I'm happy to be out of it. But, um, but, you know, I did a couple of years in Adelaide and then I was actually in, in London for four years, did some project management marketing over there while the London Olympics were on, which was obviously four years ago now. Um, and then was sort of in, back in, in law, in-house, working uh, in a big retail software company, doing some IP and, and outsourcing. So really, that's where I kind of got back into the, into the software side of things from a different perspective, Albie. But um, I was then kind of at a, a, you know, having a beer at a pub with a mate, um, talking about ag tech and the opportunities and where I thought you know, there, was, there was a real kind of spot for, for people to be involved and a mutual friend of, of the other two co-founders said, oh, I just finished um, I just finished an MBA at Oxford with a couple of guys that have just gone down to Oz to, to check that out. You should, um, you should get in touch. So, you know, I thought, oh, it's just another one of those conversations that never really goes anywhere. Um, the next day I had a Skype chat with Kevin, one of, one of our other co-founders, and now uh, we had a great chat and, and solved all the problems of the ag tech world. Not quite, but um, the, the next day he, uh, he emailed me saying, look, why don't you come and join us and, and roll up the sleeves? So, I was pretty fired up and, and we, you know, obviously kicked it off pretty well. I, I basically resigned from work. Um, I hadn't met these guys. So everyone's like, you're absolutely mad. And I said, well, I might be mad, but if I, uh, if I believe in it and these guys believe in it, they wouldn't be doing it if they didn't. So I, um, I packed up my toys and, and came back to Oz. And uh, we kicked it off in, in a garage just um, over in, in Windsor. So there were three of us. Um, and then we kind of went about building the team there, really focusing on um, building kind of a core, the best talent we could get our hands on in, and, and approaching the building of the product and the business in, in a bit of a different way. And we can go through some of that, but um, I've got a few slides to, to flip through. So you may have seen this video. I know some of The AgReb Notebook is a simple and easy to use tool that is going to use on-farm data to transform the livestock industry. I'm a third generation farmer. The decision making is largely done by Dad and myself. I'm bringing new ideas and I suppose a drive to increase our production capacity on the farm. My family's been involved in sheep and cattle production for five generations and I've always seen the opportunity for technology to be involved in this space. Technology moving the farm forward is really about making sure you've got good quality data that you can use to make decisions off. When we set about actually building the tool, we made sure it was very simple to use. Anything that they would want to record on their farm, right from their livestock information, paddock information, full task management, plus all of their inventory management, can all be encapsulated in one platform. We decided to buy the software because we've been growing our business quite a lot in the last few years. We wanted to have something that would help us communicate better with our staff. I think the way that the guys have gone about thinking about how we might actually interact with the software is a big step forward compared to some of the other competitor products on the market. Now we can monitor paddocks 365 days of the year and we can then take that information back and start to benchmark our business. Being easy to use and being intuitive means that it's easy for me to learn but also easier for Dad to pick up and be able to use as well. I um, struggle with some of the technology but I think this one has got enough common sense about it that move it on the map or something like that, the job will be done and it just saves you time. If there are jobs, instead of things going to a diary or a bit of paper and they get lost, we can actually now put them in the taskbar and then we can all access that information. The ability for other people, our accountants, agronomists, pick up the data they need without hassling us on the phone. You can say, well, it's all there. We've done a lot of record keeping, but now to have everything in one tablet that we can share with all our partners, I think's a really big plus. All of our software development is in-house in Australia. That gives us the ability to actually get out, meet farmers, work with them to actually build what the customer wants and what the industry wants. If they're willing to develop the software from feedback that we give them, they're delivering us a product that we want. The fact that you can give information back to them and they're willing to listen. And the more feedback we give back to AgriWeb, the better I think this product will be. We want to actually create this trusted relationship with the farmer. We want to build an end-to-end -end solution for them where they can integrate their entire process through our platform. As we grow our business, 
the tablet is something that I feel is going to grow with us. It's going to become an incredibly powerful tool for producers making day-to-day -day decisions. I feel that we're in a really exciting time in this agriculture game. The red meat industry is really roaring along at the moment and it's giving people the ability to really get ahead in their business. I hope that we leave this bit of dirt better than when I took it over. I hope that I can use the tools available to me to make good decisions to maintain a profitable business and leave the farming land in a healthy state to be able to pass on to future generations. Eventually we would like to see this company innovate this whole entire industry when somebody can actually think about technology, they think about AgriWeb. So I guess um, without boring you too much on PowerPoint slides, um, it really gets back to well, well, why why AgriWeb and, and why are we doing this and, and really, as, as I mentioned before, you know, we honestly <coughs> fundamentally believe that, that we can innovate, disrupt and revolutionise this space. Um, and the way we're going about doing that is, is finding, you know, top class technical talent to go away and build this. Um, really kind of shift what uh, the, the current products in the market or, or legacy products that have been around, you know, 20 or 30 years have done in terms of heavy desktop kind of, you know, Excel looking, looking uh, software into something that, that, you know, people in the ag space aren't necessarily familiar with, but how they visualize what it is and, and we'll go through that but but really um, you know that that's hugely important we have them in-house you know and that means that, that as the video said you know we can actually everyone gets out on farm once a month including all the developers they can actually meet all the customers they get those feedback and then they go away and build it so everything we build is based purely and driven on, on customer feedback um, and similarly the way we use customer support is is every week um, we have one of our developers that, that kind of sits on the customer, the customer service call and they rotate every week so that they're speaking to customers and they're hearing the problems so they can fix it rather than a tech guy sitting in a, in, in a silo building a nice little widget that they think is cool which in fact isn't because a farm can't use it. Um, the other one is, is right you know let's, let's approach it differently um, let, let's go after after some um, some capital and and really inject it and go from there. So, you know, in terms of the the, the team, you know, um, we've got two guys doing PhDs um, and and a fair bit of kind of power there. And, and our CTO was actually the the, the first employee of a company called On Air that put internet on airplanes that, that later got sold to Airbus. Um, and other guys <coughs> doing his PhD unraveling DNA at the Garvin Institute to look at. So, so some pretty interesting minds and they're doing that stuff um, and then you know we, we have a mix of, of you know different backgrounds from, from the management point of view in, in finance, commercial and technology, how do I say law, it's there at some point um, and you know the, the way we go about it is, is finding people that are just exci excited to be part of it and, and uh, think that we can, we can do a few things. So um, I, I just want to show you this this slide here in terms of, of, of what this means, I mean, you know, we've got customers in every state. Um, the bulk of them, New South Wales, SA and TAS. Uh, SA is leading the way, so, you know, this there shows you, um, I guess, the mindset of, of people in different regions. Obviously, our lead generation has, has kicked off. We released our, our software, our, our app, um, about 15 months ago, 1 July last year. So we're now kind of into our second financial year of commercial release um, and, and you know things are really starting to, to lift up. Obviously you know revenue is a good one but, but the big one really that I try and focus on is this activity per user because it doesn't matter if we sell you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of apps if people aren't using it then you know the customer is not getting the benefit nor are we as, and nor is anyone else and it comes back to the information and the data and, and that's what we, what we like to focus on is the usability and make sure that we get it right and people are using it rather than oh well let's just you know, expand it as quickly as possible and get it out there. So that's sort of a, a big priority for us on, on that and, and you know that's the way we focus a lot of our attention. Um, and you know just to go through go through some of the, the stats, I mean, as I said, there were three of us when we, when we kicked it off. AgriWeb's been around about two and a half years. Um, 
you know, those early days, as I mentioned, we were, we were in a garage. Um, there was two of us down in, in Windsor. Our, our developer at the time was in Sydney. I remember going up to, to Sydney when it wasn't, you know, I, I got back here in January um, of 2015. Where's this product we're gonna go sell? It didn't exist, so I was like, right. So we flew to Sydney and our developer was literally working in a cave. It was his, his, um, his mum's basement that he turned into, into this room, den type, creepy sort of setup. And, and uh, we couldn't afford a hotel room. So Kevin and I, my other co-founder, one of the other co-founders who's six foot five, rode in the world champs for the US, is big, hairy, smelly, and he and I shared our CTO's double bed. And um, we did that for two weeks and we didn't leave until the job was done. And, um, and we eventually got kicked out because his sister was had enough of us kind of leaving Vegemite all over the kitchen table. But, you know, it's those stories that are, that are funny to look back on, you know, when we kind of think that, that we are sort of making some tracks. We had 13 customers, which were basically my cousins and mates and neighbours that I convinced to buy. Um, so hardly a, a strong, you know, picture there. Early revenue numbers, um, you know, ag again, um, a couple of cousins and we pretty much get up to the uh, acres under management pretty quickly. Um, we'd obviously got seed funding at the 500k, which came from some high net worths um, that, that allowed us to, to kick that off. And we've also targeted a lot of the, the R&D and the other grants that are available out there. Um, and then if we go to July this year, we've now got 13 full-time employees, seven of which are, um, are developers. Um, I, I wanted to add a, a few kind of stats in here because this was a slide I prepared for another AgTech meetup in Adelaide. Um, we're now tracking at about 350. We're sort of signing 50 to 60 new customers a month, um, which, which we're you know, pretty happy with in terms of, you know, it's, it's a slow moving industry. Um, you know, it's not an Instagram app, it never will be, but that's some, some pretty good growth. Um, and, and these numbers start to be pretty exciting as well in terms of the power and information. Um, so, you know, while these numbers might not kind of blow your socks off when we start looking at, at these types of figures, um, we can start doing some, some pretty powerful stuff with that. Uh, we've closed our second round of funding in March, which was $3 million. Again, we probably spent 12 months on the, on the um, investment trail, um, probably went to 100 meetings. And uh, I remember Justin and West Webb, our other co-founder, when we started this journey, said he's, he's had a couple of startups before and a, and a couple of exits, and he said, we're going to have 100 meetings, and it's going to be tough, but we'll get there in the end. And, and we kind of swanned into the first couple thinking, oh, this will be easy, and we'll get five million. And of course, it, it wasn't easy, and it didn't happen, and it was a very long, slow burn. But we got there in the end, and there was a lot of learnings along the way. Um, but good to close that off. Again, we sort of um, can have a chat about you know, the style of, of investment, the appetite for investment in Australia is very different to the US, for example. Um, the risk appetite is, is a lot different, and um, you know, Australia will probably get there, but, but we're just in a small little environment, and, um, and you know, the, the style in, in the US where a VC might come in and go, well, I'll invest in 10 companies, one will be a unicorn and, and, will, and will absolutely nail it. The other nine will die and that's fine. That approach doesn't really exist in Australia. Um, so we'll see how that kind of develops over time. R&D grant again. Um, we applied for the Accelerating Commercialisation Grant. I'm not sure if any of you guys are familiar with that, but it's through the Commonwealth Government. Um, it's a pretty good one to get in terms of its match funding dollar for dollar up to a million dollars. So if you apply for it, then you have to have that money backed. Um, but it is, it's, it's free money in that, you know, you're not giving away equity for it, so that's, that's a great result. Um, and, you know, you build out a project plan, they audit you, and you tick off kind of milestones and you get the money. So, so that's been a great one. It, it, again, it took us about 12 months to get. None of this stuff is quick and easy, but, you know, if you stick at it, um, you'll get there. Um, and there's some, some cool stuff going on in the other grant space as well. So it's one of those things where, you know, if any of you are in this space looking to do that, it's out there, you just need to kind of go and have a look. Um, and then um, the I Awards, um, which was in uh, a month or so ago, we actually won two awards in, in Victoria, um, the Primary Industries Award and Startup of the Year. So 
that was um, another one of those ones where we got a call from uh, from these guys saying, "Oh, you coming to the Isle Awards?" And I'm like, "No, it's 200 bucks a ticket." And like, I've got other stuff on. Oh, I, I think you should come. <laughs> I was like, "Okay, we'll come." So we went there and and um, we uh, ended up taking out those those two, which was which was pretty cool. Um, and there was actually 600 applicants across Victoria wide in all industries for, for that. So you know, I think that's exciting. You know, from, from our point of view, but but exciting from an industry point of view to, to see that there's, there's some recognition for, for the ag tech space. Um, and we're actually now in, in the nationals, we just made the, the national final, um, which is out of 10 on the 1st of September. So we'll see how we go on that. Um, but yeah, I just thought it sort of interesting to show you that, um, you know, I, I feel like this period has been five years and I've got great hairs to prove it, but, um, you know, happy that, that, that we've made a bit of ground on that. Where are we going in the, in the next 12 months? We've got some sort of strategic and, and software and development and stuff we're, we're looking to do. We're actually engaged in a strategic partnership with Bayer Animal Health. Um, and the exciting thing about those guys is, is they have the same strategic direction as what we do in terms of where they're looking to take animal production. And, and again, it gets back to, it's not just about, it's not about record keeping, it's not about any of those types of mundane issues. It's about making things more productive. Uh, and the other exciting thing, which I think Bayer are taking a different approach to um, a lot of other groups or industries out there, <laughs> the amount of times I hear you're not a, a beef grower, you're not a sheep grower, you're a, you're a grass grower, you know, because it's about the grass and, and, and I agree, it is. But Bayer's approach also is, well actually it's about the animal. You know, if we're focusing on a livestock industry, there's a lot of effort that goes into getting the grass into the body but there's no effort in actually what's happening with that conversion and making that animal the most efficient it can be. And that may be through the grass, it may be through feed supplements, it may be through animal health products, it may be through production techniques and making sure that you know, the animals put in the best possible scenario can to, to excel and produce. Um, and that doesn't happen in the industry. You know what I mean? I, I don't know how many of you guys are farmers, but but let me tell you, it's it's you know, 90% of guys are using this, and and that's how they're running their business as well. So there's a lot of work to be done, and it's not rocket science. How can we present that information? I was saying this earlier. There's a lot of best practice information out there. You go to every conference, and you walk away with booklets, and you get really excited, and that's awesome. But it sits on the kitchen table, and and then nothing happens with it because well, I'm too busy, and I don't actually know how to implement it. So what we're doing with Bayer is, is we've got access to their sales managers. So I've, I've just finished training 16 uh, of their area managers based across Australia, and they are basically a sales arm for us who we pay a commission to. But their goal that, that we're building the software platform, this advisor type structure where, you know, advisor, it might be a Bayer representative, it might be a banker, it might be a consultant, an agronomist, an accountant that can go in and actually have access to real-time data and then assist and facilitate and everyone does the job better and everyone gets a better product and a better result. Um, and Bayer want to kind of pull these protocols, these best practice techniques into the platform, build this sort of operational style approach where, you know, the farmer actually, oh, you need to do this now, oh, you need to do that now, and, and all of a sudden, we know how much everything costs and we do things for a reason because the data backs it up rather than, well, the wind's blowing that way. Um, so that's an exciting piece there and, and obviously just the flow of, of, of the way the company goes and you know we can we can talk through that but obviously with the software that the thing is it's always evolving and, and there's plenty to build and then within 12 to 18 months we'll, we'll probably be back at the trough looking for the next round um, to, to re-inject to re it to, 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 go, to go and do it again. Um, so that's kind of that. Um, I was gonna gonna go through and, and show you um, a, a demo of the actual soft, the, the software, the app. Um, so I'll plug that in. If anyone's got any questions, again, just feel free to fire them, fire them across. If you're investors, yep. Are they um, sort of typically interested in ag investments, or are they? from other 
Um, so, so we we sort of had this grassroots approach where they have been high net worths and connections and, and that route, um, and many of them are either you know corporate style farmers. We actually do have customers and farmers that are investors as well, um, and and just sort of you know a couple of you know Ingham Chickens is or, or a member of Ingham Chickens is one. Um, in terms of the next round of investment, what will we look at there? I mean, sure, we'll look at whoever wants to give us money, but, but really, that's not quite the whole picture. It's about, okay, well, we want to partner with the right investor, someone that can actually you know, provide that advice, provide that strategic direction, open doors or whatever it might be, and that might be an industry stakeholder, um, or it might be a VC, or, or it might be you know, a, a number of other groups along the way. Um, because I think it's, you know, getting money is one thing, and don't get me wrong, it's very difficult to do that, and you need money to survive, otherwise you don't exist. But it's, it's hugely, it's just as important, and if you're in an ideal position and people are throwing lots of money at you, then great, I don't know how often that happens, but if you are, then you can cherry pick. But I think it is important to be strategic about that, because that can be invaluable in terms of strategic channel partners or opening doors, um, and just day to day, you know, being there, done that, do this, don't do that, you know, style of, of, of help as well. So I think that's a big part of it. And with the first round, sorry about the questions, um, did you approach like traditional VCs? Or yeah. Something? And how, was, how, was, how did they sort of react? Are they sort of agriculture? We're not really. No, no, I mean, not at all. I think, I think they were excited about the ag space, but it gets back to that appetite for risk. Um, you're too early. You know, um, you've got 17 customers, or by this stage we had a few more, or, or you know, you don't have ongoing revenue yet. We can't see the revenue stream. Um, Monetisation of data. Well, what does that mean? And these are all the things that, that are logical in the sense that yeah, well, we don't know what monetisation of data means. But what we do know is that you know, LinkedIn raised five million dollars when not only did they not have, you know, um, a monetisation route. They didn't have a product. They had, you know, they had nothing, and they still managed to. to and there's a million examples of that. And it just gets back to kind of that appetite for, for risk and, and and a different model. So um, again, I think that that's changing. But what we saw, a lot of it was like, well, you're too early. You know, you don't have ongoing revenue yet. You don't have a big enough percentage of the market. Those sort of typical style questions, which is more of a traditional investment route. Nothing like a um, tech company not being able to work tech, eh? So, um, I mean, keep, keep the questions firing, but I, I did just want to run through what, you know, I've talked a lot about kind of what we're doing, but not actually what the product is. So, you know, it, it is a, a record keeping um, app. At the moment, it's an Android app. Um, we did that because a couple of reasons in terms of, you know, using, using Google's technology, etc. Um, we're now in the process of, of scoping some new technology to roll out on iOS. 95% I would say of farmers out there are on iPads or iPhones um, and it's incredibly challenging when you're rocking up with an Android app. Um, we're well aware of that and, and we're in the process. Part of that grant is, is pulling out the iOS stuff. Um, so, so that's what we're working on at the moment. Aside from that, when we sort of set about, about doing it, it was, um, it was about, well, we want to kind of package it up as a farm management tool so it's separate from 
you know, the kids playing on the eye line so you can do all your records while you're in the paddock. And, you know, it covers everything from livestock, cropping, inventory, um, tasks as well. And the, on the basis that, you know, it is a tool, you know, go away and manage your farm. But now we're at a point where we're not going to be able to scale until we get on iOS because everyone's like, oh, that's really awesome. Come back to us when it's on. I've got five guys who've all got iPhones. Like I don't want to buy five tablets, and and we get that. So so that's um, a big part of it. But at the moment, you know, we're it, we're, we're packaging up on on a Samsung tablet with a tough case, and and for the most part, that that, that is, you know, a um, a, a a decent um, proposition. So you know, again, it covers it covers anything on farm you'd, you'd want to um, you'd want to record down. But really, it's it's this visualization uh, of how the farmer thinks. So you know their farm map on the screen. It, it's cloud based. They can go and build all their maps through our uh, through our cloud platform. It's sent straight down onto their app. And from here, you know it's all very visual, touch screen. You know we're getting a lot of information here in terms of right. You know that's a mob of sheep. Again, I don't know how many people are actually from an ag background, so if you have no idea what I'm talking about, then let me know. Um, how many is in the, in the paddock? Tag colours. We've got these icons here with holding an ESI. They're sort of withholding periods. It means you've applied an animal health treatment. So visually, you're looking at that going, right, well, I know what's happening from, from a snapshot. Um, the next kind of key bit is, is usability, and it's all drag and drop. If you want to move a mob, you know, you basically pick them up uh, with your finger, drag to a paddock, um, and then you can split, you can merge, you can do all those types of things. Um, and then you basically save it down. So, so that there, in terms of um, how a farmer would see, sorry, I'll just get this so it doesn't keep rotating around. That there is kind of already a game changer for, for a farmer and, and some legacy software out there. Uh, this, this one product called Pam, um, you know, been around for a while, they're, 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 they're doing their thing. A customer that got on board, this was ex-Pam, said, oh, I'll come show you how to move a mop. So we went into his office, we fired up his computer, we sat there for five minutes with drop-down menus, and we gave up, because he couldn't remember how to move a mop. And so, that there, in, when you're used to tech and apps, you might think, oh, yeah, well, cool, no big deal. But that's kind of game-changing from, from what these are used to in terms of the products out there. Um, and then you know anything else you're looking to record down, you know if you click on if you click on a mob, you know you're going to get top level information here. Those those days, those restrictions are counting down. You got DSE information which feeds into production making decisions on on what's you know what's performing and what's not. You know you've got weight, what they are, and then if you go one level further, you know it's going to bring up this form where anything you're looking to record down goes in here. So selling records. You know, when you when you do that, now you're actually plugging in all the all the financial information of what you got when, and that feeds into a sales report. Um, you know, all these other treatments, weight gains, preg, marking, feed, these types of um, these types of records. You know, the medical history are required for audit requirements. You know, what you did when, what are the batch numbers, what are the expiry dates, and these guys are like writing on their jeans or the windscreen of the Hilux or it's in the head and then the auditor comes around. Do you already have those records like on a computer? Can they upload those? Uh, so not yet, they, they can't. Um, we don't have the ability, I mean it can all happen but we don't have an import yet. Um, it's a good point, there's a lot of other, you know, we can import maps and a few other bits and pieces, some rainfall data but, but not everything. Um, that hasn't been a huge issue because there's a, there's a top tier of farmers that have that in a spreadsheet, but most don't. So we are sadly starting from a low base, so it doesn't pop up too much, but, but appreciate that would, be, that would be handy. But, you know, I mean, I won't go through all this, but the point is, this here is gonna draw straight from their inventory. You click on this, it reduces down how much you've used, your batch number expiry days there. All these forms are tailored to meet, you know, the JBS Farm Assurance, those accreditation bodies. If you don't wanna fill it out, you know, you don't need to fill out those forms, you basically just save it down. It's going to reduce your inventory item and on your report, apply a cost to everything. So you get a perfect cost of animal health, a perfect cost of feed, 
you know, labour unit costs. So that everything you do, oh, I'm doing my records, oh, cool, I just pulled out a report and now I know how much everything costs, maybe I'll make a different decision. It's the same old story as the amount of times I go into a paddock. Oh, how much are you spending on that, that salt, lit, you know, a, a nutritional product? Oh, I don't know, about five or six grand. Okay, well, and what are you getting in return? You know, what weight gain are you getting or, or what condition score improvement are you getting? Oh, why? I've just always done it. And, and that seems sort of, you know, and some people don't even know their stock numbers, which is obviously the main driver in their business. Um, it, it's quite staggering when you think about, when you think about that. Now, again, if people are, uh, are running a better operation, they're doing like, well, that's great, like, but I know that that's, that's not a big percentage of farmers out there. Um, so that's the point, you know, anything, anything I, they want to record down goes in here. It's then, you know, stored natively on the app. When they hit a connection that sinks in, we can then generate some reports. We can pull some decision-making tools out of it. Um, so that's kind of, you know, there's, there's a lot of other um, parts to that, but, but just to kind of keep it going. Um, the paddock section again, very visual, colour coded for different reasons. So you might want to colour code them with different pasture or crop types. You might want to colour code them and print them off to a contract and say spray the orange ones. The red ones um, are actually indicate and come up automatically that the paddock's in withholding. So if you click on that, those withholding days actually count down. If you try and drop stock in there, you get a notification to say, oh, this paddock's in withholding. What is withholding? What is withholding? So withholding period means that. For whatever reason, you shouldn't be dealing with um, with that animal. It might be like if they're going off to, to slaughter or something like that, um, that you can't... So if a paddock's in withholding, it'll mean you can't put stock in that paddock because there's a chemical in there. Or it might be that you apply a drench or a vaccine or something to an animal, and during a period of time, they can't go to slaughter, go to abattoir because there's a chemical in the system that might have other impacts, health impacts, etc. Um, and the reason it's, it's, it's because they're not meant to be doing certain things when there's a withholding period and a lot of the time the things are happening because they don't know or they forget or, or whatever it might be. And it really then gets back into the bigger picture of transparency and traceability and, and what product is the end consumer getting along the way. Um, and to be fair, Australia and New Zealand are leading the world in, in sort of in ag or ag tech, but also in terms of production and, and the product. I mean, we have a premium product that, that we sell all across the world at a premium price. You go to the US, it's a completely different style. They don't do records because they don't need to do records because there's no requirements. There's no kind of regulations that, that kind of helps with that. Now, we've got a lot of work that we can do and, and we probably will do, but we're, we are a lot you know, more advanced than, than other parts of the world. So. Um, so have you built in all those withholding periods into the products in the app? Yeah, so when you build out your inventory items, we've got a list of chemicals in there, it preloads your withholding in ESI, so that when you apply that, that withholding links in and applies that visually for your management, but also on the records for your, for your products. Is that also in the US's whole target market for you? Is that I mean, US is definitely will be a target market because it's the biggest livestock, you know, um, market in the world, you know, they have a million farms and, and you know, they're the biggest cattle producers. So we would absolutely like to get over there. Um, Kevin did a bit of a fact-finding mission earlier in the year and was surprised at, at their style in that a lot of them, you know, they're cowboys, it's just a number and, and you know, the, the way their animals work is, you know, 90% of them go through a feedlot where over here that percentage is a lot different, and also a lot of them aren't owned by the farmer. You know, they're, they're owned by suits in Chicago and New York through the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and they're just a commodity that's just whipped around, and there's rental fees. It's, it's an entirely different space. Um, so approaching that market for us will probably need to be a different style rather than we're obviously going from the ground up here, get farmers on board, get users on board, then we can go to other industry stakeholders and, and get them to buy into the idea and, and the concept that over there it may be a different approach where we have to come from the top down. Maybe it has to be through JBS who's the second biggest buyer over there. Maybe it's through a McDonald's or a Chipotle or I don't know, whatever it might be. It would be a different approach. So, And again, you know, we obviously need to get it right here before we worry about other territories. But um, 
you know, the, the, ag, the ag opportunity is a global opportunity. It's just, um, you know, I think you need to be very careful about how it's approached. So. Um, anyway, I mean, I'll just, you know, this, this is the paddock section. Again, anything that, that people want to record down, this form here would be very familiar to a form that people are filling out in a tractor. They're spray records, spray or fertiliser records that they're required to, to kind of fill out. Again, you know, rates, chemicals, all that sort of stuff. You can set your application up um, here and then, and then your weather, which will actually auto-populate your conditions. And these are, again, legal requirements for people to fill out. So, you know, making this, which they have to do a burden, simple and easy, they do it in the tractor while, it, while it's done and they get home and, and all their record keeping sort of finished. So, you need the Delta T and all that? Or yeah, uh, like, don't go spraying today before you do it. it it's not going to, it's not, yet. Yeah, it's not going to say like you yeah. shouldn't spray. This is just basically populating yeah, spray those conditions. Off, yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what that is. Um, and then, you know, all your, if you're feeding out hay and grain and stuff like that, it's again going to draw from your inventory levels that you can come across. So, um, you know, that, that that's the point. There's also a task management section which you can, um, which you can actually drop a GPS pin so it works out exactly where you are in the paddock. You can then build out a pin, assign it to someone, um, and then you know set due date so then it becomes their jobs list as well. Uh, you can also pick up the pin and then drop it to a specific location so that people know exactly where to go and find that weed or that post or whatever it is. Um, so again, removing that need for <coughs> writing a list at the start of the week and giving it to their, to their five workers. Um, and there's you know reports that pull out on that, and then um, you know all your all your inventory items sit here for all your records, um, rainfall as well. So again, you know the idea being anything they want to record down goes in here. It's a one-stop shop. We'll also be looking to plug into on-farm hardware, so RFID technology, which is ear tag technology, soil monitoring, water monitoring, so we can actually have you know that remote remote water water monitoring comes straight into the app, right into the other side of things, you know, the financial software, the zeros, the myops of the world. Um, the concept being, we can't do everything, we want to be the experts in farm management software. There's plenty of experts in accounting software and plenty of experts building hardware, that's great. We just want to plug into them. So anyone who wants to play ball, then then let's hit the um, stadium and plug in. So that's kind of the, the, the um, theory behind all of that. So John, just on that, are you building a platform that has an API that yep. people can write plugins, modules, and yeah, stuff? Exactly. So it's you know, it's all sort of open APIs. So, you know, when we find partners or people that want to integrate, you know, it's it's built so it allows for that facilitation. Um, you know, thankfully most people or most companies that are looking to to be progressive and innovative have the same style, same API style approach, um, which which allows for that kind of transfer and Integration. So that's that's exactly how it is um, on on those fronts. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. What's the hardest thing in terms of farmers' behaviour to get them to change and adapt to, to the to the system? Okay. I guess it's two points. Are we are we selling it? Have we sold it to them yet? Because that's really hard. <laughs> but once we've sold it, I think it's I think it's a, a, a shift in uh, habits and nature. Mm -hmm. You know, it's um, and and that will be from our point of view helped a bit in terms of at the moment it's on a tablet. You know, will be, you know, in in a number of months it'll be on their iPhone in the pocket, and that makes it, you know, a, a much easier proposition because they're not taking something else with them. They've always got the phone, um, but it's still changing the mindset of, oh, well, I'll do it, I'll do it now, and it'll take me two seconds rather than in a week when I've forgotten it takes me ten minutes. So there is that change, but when we see that people have made that habit change, then they're away and they're much better for it and excited about it. You know, we've now got customers coming back saying, well, I just, you know, I use it every day and it doesn't leave my side and everything goes in there. And that's obviously really exciting to hear. So I think there is definitely that point of, okay, well now I can, you know, now it's easy, I do it now and, and it's done once. But but there is definitely that, that, that shift there. Um, there's also a bit of obviously we're trying to build as simple and easy as we can. There's still a generational age thing where you know the average farmer age is I don't know 56 or something, 
and 64, or is it? Uh, no, 57, I think. So. Yeah. Spot on. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, they're just not familiar with tech products. And a lot of the time, our, our support is not like, how do I move a mob? How do I connect to my Wi Fi? <coughs> you know, how do I turn the tablet on? You know, wh whatever it might be, um, it's frustrating for us because, like, we're not your tech support, but obviously it's required. Um, so, so that's just the nature of the industry we're in. Is that there is that shift, um, but again, you know, when when people are embedded in it, then then that usability goes up, um, and that's another reason why the way we build our, our software is we we do unreleased every one to two weeks, so it's continuing to evolve and change, which means we can be dynamic, obviously fix bugs along the way, but respond to customer feedback quickly, um, and what it's also doing is as we layer on that function. Oh, well, I know how to move a mob. Oh, cool, I can drench a mob because I've done that rather than, okay, here's a Ferrari when you don't know how to drive. It's just completely overwhelming. Um, and that's why, you know, we've, we've started a mob-based application which is tracking things at that mob level where best practice and the way that the industry will probably be, be driven is through individual RFID. So you're tracking animals at an individual level. EID, you know, that, that kind of electronic ear tag so you can actually work out which animal is performing and which one's not and, and base your decisions off that. The non-performing ones get sold, the high-performing ones get looked after, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, and we'll be integrating into those hardware tools as well. It's a case of um, either a lot of people aren't doing it because the barrier to entry is a bit higher, there's a bit of hardware outlay that people need to make. When they've made that outlay, they don't know what to do with the information, so it's being collected, and it sits on a thumb drive, or it sits on a spreadsheet, and there's still not those decisions being made. So um, we hear it a bit as like, oh, does it, you know, it's a plug into my Gallagher, you know, reader, and it's like, well, not yet, but it will. We're having those conversations. Oh, well, I don't need it until then. It's like, okay, well, what are you doing with, you know, what are you doing with your information, and what do you want to do? Oh, well, I don't know. I just, well, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But like, so it's about, it's about driving the, okay, well, it's being collected now, and here's a decision, or present the information in a way that you can go, oh, well, that's obvious, like, you know, that line of, of views is not performing, let's get, get rid of them. Or, oh, these guys need some supplement feeding, or, or whatever it is. Have they done with actually setting up all the Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I, I, can, I can run you through that as well, but it's very, our portal is basically a, a, an overlay of Google Maps, you know, I'm wondering like, if you had that problem with the ones, the older, older farmers. Building their maps, yeah. yeah. I mean, literally, we have 70, year old, 70 plus year old farmers building their maps in under an hour oh, just yeah. because it's simple and easy. And, and a lot of people think there's that barrier to entry to get sorted. When they see that, they're like, oh my God, that's amazing. That's good. Yeah. So, I mean, if there's Wi Fi here, I can plug that in. So, you don't provide a set up implementation service? Um, we can. We can build their maps, we just, we just charge a fee for it. Yep. And, and we find that two reasons, we don't want to do that because our core business is not building maps and... and not just maps, but the whole farm set up, cattle, everything. So, um, we, we, don't, we don't provide that setup because um, A, it's much more efficient for, for the farmer to do it because they know what, what it is. And also, we want the farmer to, to do that to get used to it, otherwise, there's, they're missing out on that training as well. You don't think the advisor's going to eventually do that for you? Um, potentially. You advise you yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the advisor portal will, will allow that, you know, what, what we're building is what we're calling this operational calendar, which I mentioned at the start, which will basically facilitate, you know, the advisor could sit down with, with the farmer or the farmer could do it on their own, how, how they want to do it, plan out their entire year and say, right, well, you know, I want a lamb on this date, I want a shear on this date, and I'm, and I'm sowing on this date. It will then pre-populate a number of events, which, which are linked in terms of joining dates and trimesters, etc. And from there, they can record against that and say, oh, well, you know, I'm doing X, Y, Z now. Um, but, you know, have you done vaccine level one? Have you followed up with the second vaccine six weeks later? Those types of of best practice techniques often aren't being done. I mean, I had another conversation with a farmer the other day and, um, and he said to his wife, oh, we're lambing. And she's like, well, yeah, we're lambing. She's like, but that, but that comes after scanning. And scanning is like where you, you pre-test them. 
It's like, yeah, well, well, that happens, you know, three, three months. He's like, but we didn't scan. Like, they just completely forgot. Like, they didn't do a key management kind of task, which can then make follow-on decisions, because they just forgot, and they didn't realise until they landed. So, you know, it's, it's these types of things where this operational calendar will allow notifications, which then feeds into the advisor, and, you know, it'll advise, it'll notif notifies the advisor as well to say, oh, these guys did, did or did not do this, and, and kind of facilitates that, that best practice. So I think you mentioned before you did a three million dollars seed race. Yep. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. I guess it depends. We we had five hundred thousand in in Angel, and then we raised three million dollars. Um, call it what you will in terms of it's not a Series A, but you know it might be a gap round or whatever. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just curious to hear how that looked. I mean, there's obviously not many examples of ag tech startups raising that kind of money yep. in Australia. So yeah, curious to hear how you went about it and, and what was easy, what was hard? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess it gets back to a few things I've, I've covered off. I mean, it, it was a long road, it was very difficult and we had a number of conversations and meetings um, and we had a few change in tax of, we learned a lot in terms of the direction of our business as well along the process. But, um, you know, we, we started off approaching various groups and again, the response with some of those more larger VC groups was, you know, we were just too early and we didn't have, they didn't have the risk appetite at that point in time. So then we really focused it more in on, on the, um, on the kind of grassroots funding, and we actually called it a grassroots round. Um, and you know, we we kind of extended our networks um, and and kind of got small packets of of money along the way, um, and we offered sort of units of you know, 50,000 at the smallest, up to, you know, we had, we had a couple of groups that, that, that put in a million. So anywhere between that, um, and, and yeah, you know, it was, it was a long road and, and took sort of 12 months by the time we had early conversations, by the time we, we closed, not, not quite 12 months. Um, but again, you know, the, the learnings from that were, okay, well, make sure you've got a very kind of tight process and, and plan of, of what, what you're actually all about and what you're delivering, um, but also be targeted in the people that, that you're actually looking to go after. Um, you know, there was a lot of conversations we had that didn't need to be had because they either weren't interested in ag or they weren't interested in the stage we were at. Um, and, and, and you know, you can waste a lot of time by doing that. And also, you know, you in an ideal world, you would like to get that investor that is not as passive but can actually help and advise and, and kind of point you in the right direction as well. Um, coupled with that investment at the time we're going for the accelerating commercialisation grant on the basis that if we could get money to back it, we get the grant. Um, getting the grant obviously gave confidence to investors on the okay, well if the government's done their due diligence and they have kind of, you know, signed them off as, as a legitimate punter, then that gives us confidence and, and we can put our money in. Um, so, you know, that, I guess that, that, that's what I would, I would say about that, so. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, what's the price model like? Price model, so, so basically, I mean, there's, it's, there's an upfront cost, um, and then there's an, a subscription as well. So, you know, you get, a farmer gets that, which is the hardware, so a Samsung tablet and a tough case and, and the app uh, for $1,100. And they can add on other devices, multiple devices, if they wish, for, for seven fifty each. Um, that gets them up and running. It gives them access to the to the portal, obviously, where they go and build all their maps out. And then ongoing, fifty bucks a month supports two users. Uh, and then if they want to add users on, it, it's twenty dollars per user per month, which which basically gives fairness to the size of operations, but also it, it allows us to scale. Where if we've got someone that's you know got a very large operation that's got five or six users, they're paying an amount that's proportional to, to the size of the operation, right down to, you know, we, we do offer a, um, what we call a hobby farmer subscription model, which is $15 per month, which gives you one user, but limited capability in reports and analytics. Uh, and, you know, we would always, probably 95% of our customers are on our commercial, which is 50, and we'd always say that if, if you're gonna go down the path of the 15 a month, then, you know, 
it, it, it can't be a serious commercial operation on the basis that if you're not deriving $50 worth of value out of this, there's two problems. Either the product is good enough, in which case you need to tell us and we'll make sure it is, or you're not using it to its full extent and not making those decisions to, to get that money back. Um, so, but you know, having said that, we've got someone that's 150 sheep out of Melbourne, you know, 45 minutes out of Melbourne, and the records go in there, and a sister in South Africa can log in and, and see her records, and, and she's happy as Larry. So, you know, um, we've tried to we've tried to really build it so that you know we do have a full breadth of customers, right from from the hobby farmer up to you know a corporate pastoral operation that has 20,000 head on on one station type of thing. Um, and you know, I'd say it's, it's tailored for those mixed operators that, that have, uh, you know, a bit of cropping operation, a bit of, a bit of livestock operation, um, but really opening up to, to everyone that wants to. And, and, and to be fair, I mean, you know, farmers are, and you know, my family's in farming as well, inherently tight, mm -hmm. and and you know, not necessarily can see value in, in shiny tech products. So we get that. Um, and, you know, we don't get too much pushback in terms of pricing. You know, that's reasonable, you know, that, 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 that works. Um, you know, 600 bucks a year, again, if you're not getting value out of that in, in time saving alone, you know, if, if you say, say 10 minutes a day with this, then that equates to a week in the year. Again, farmers aren't great at valuing their time, but they should be. And it gets back to, you know, well, let's look at the you know, those three, the $20 an hour, the $100 an hour, and the $1,000 hour tasks, and, you know, your time is valuable, you should be doing a $1,000 hour task, which is planning your business, and, you know, well, maybe you pay someone to send the sheep out for $20 an hour. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of shift in mentality that, that, that needs to happen, um, which we believe we can help facilitate, but it's a slow moving beast, so, yeah. John, that's an awful lot of Yes. And so when the farmer goes back to they log on sync, yep. upload and download. If there was uh, better connectivity yep. um, always on anywhere, yep. is that going to be a game changer? Or yeah, it's just be incremental. No, it'll, it'll be a game changer for, for a number of reasons. I mean, we're running an offline app here, which we wouldn't have a business or a, or a product if it didn't run offline because most farmers just don't have connectivity, which is shocking, the fact that, you know, how can an industry drive forward without connectivity these days? You know, it just has to happen, um, and, and it's going to take time. But really, you know, from a product point of view, you can, you know, most apps that you get out there, your banking app and whatever else, like that needs connectivity. So it's much cheaper to build, it's much more versatile. Than, than the effort required to build offline apps that then sync later. So from a development point of view, if everyone had connectivity, then it would be a much easier, easier scenario for us. But I think the bigger picture is, is in terms of connectivity in general for, for people in these remoter areas um, with day-to-day -day business. You know, just having access to the internet, as people in the city know, is, is game-changing in terms of, you know, the, the pace that that other industries now work at. You know, if you think about back in the old law days where you'd write a letter, you'd send it, they'd receive it, they'd sit on it for two weeks, they'd send it back, and it could be a six week turnaround. Where now, if you send an email and you haven't got a response in six minutes, you're like, what the hell's going on? You know, it's crazy. But that's just that's just the nature of it. And I think if we want to really drive drive performance and, and, and step shifts in, in the, these industries in remote areas, then internet's going to be vital for that. Yeah, we can't control that, and, you know. But um, I think it's it's game changing for, for many reasons. <coughs> and and together with a lot of the other integration tools, that can be, you know, fanciless farming, smart farms, you know, fully integrated hardware, software. You know, if you've got connectivity, then it removes all those needs for radio frequency technology that's that's being played around with. You know. It, it, it can change all of that. So, any other questions or comments? Uh, how do you uh, get out of the competition? And, and um, it would be fairly easy to try and replicate you know, 
know, the services yep. you do there, what are you going to do about that to add a barrier to entry? And what's your point of difference from the other ones there? Well, I think, I mean, the, the point of difference to, to what else is out there currently is, you know, there's some other products out there which are forms older technology. Usability is a huge barrier to entry for, for customers and farmers getting on board. Um, we see a lot of our customer base that have come from other products because it's just too hard, I can't use it. It's not an offline, real-time app that I can do my records. I've got to get home, I've got to wind up the PC and then do my records in it, and that doesn't happen. Um, in terms of in terms of the way we're approaching it, as I said at the start, you know, we believe in in building products um, that are based off customer feedback. So our approach is different in that everything we build is is you know sure we have our milestones and what we want to build, but it's all driven through through customer feedback. An example of a, another software company that's been a legacy software company that's been around a while. A customer now one of our customers rang them and said, "Oh, it'd be really cool if you built this product." Do you think you'd be able to build that one day? Maybe you know these guys release updates once a year, and we're releasing updates once every two weeks. And the response from the software company was, "If you don't like it, don't use it." And that's just the wrong way to go about building any product. That alone, a product that you're trying to sell to farmers that are already not happy about having to embrace technology because it's hard and it's techy, and, and I don't want to do that. So, so that's kind of. But, but in terms of that's the current state of how I see the market and how we're approaching it differently, um, is focusing on the customer, building that relationship and, and, and customer services is number one priority. Um, and then moving forward, if we can do a good job on, on our priorities of customer service and we can build a good product and we continue to build a good product, then the barrier to entry for someone coming in becomes more difficult because then they need to convince a happy Agrium user, hopefully, in an ideal world, to come across onto a different platform. And we're not dealing with 16-year-old, you know, school girls and guys who are downloading the latest app and get sick of it in five minutes time. It's not really a consumer product, it's a business tool. And if the business tool is delivering what, you know, is required, then there's no appetite to move. Um, now, will there be other competitors? Yes, probably. Are there competitors right now? I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't say so. In terms of, you know, there's there's some pretty good software in the cropping side. Um, there's some some other legacy software, but no one that's trying to pull it all together. No one that wants to plug and play into everything. Um, and you know, if other competitors come along, well, that that provides a, a healthy competitive environment, and everyone's probably better off. It. You know, it's um, a lot of this time. It's it's not about the idea. You know, this here is not a patentable novel idea. It's just about execution and who can execute better you know, and faster and all of those things. Um, and, and again, you know, building a successful startup is, is about execution and sure, some wins and some, some luck along the way, but it really comes down to the, the people that can execute. Um, and you know, we believe we have a superior product and that will help our execution. But a lot of the time in, in other scenarios, it's not even about the better product. Sometimes there's a better product on the market. Um, and you know, those that execute win, win the race. Yeah. So you, you've done a good thing partnering with Bayer. Yeah. Because they're going to help you, you're going to leverage off their brand. Yeah. Uh, have a marketplace. Yeah. They're going to get you in the places where you won't. Yeah. Yeah. But they potentially also, your exit strategy. Yeah. They'll possibly be the ones who put it buying you down the yeah. track. You know, if they like what you've done, they'll work well with you. Yeah. Influence. Yeah, so. yeah, I mean, I think I think those channel partners are very important for any well, startup or any business in, in that, that's wanting to get that reach. Um, from a purely sales point of view, it's 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 slow and expensive door knocking, you know. And we are in the process now of trying to work out the best way to move from that pretty much you know face to face approach to. How do we reach scalability and get and get that incoming? Um, so you know, we're toying with ideas of that, and then one way we believe that, that is through these kind of strategic channel partners, like the likes of Bayer. Yeah. You know, they have they have the, the good brand reputation, they have the presence, they have the networks, they have the connections. Um, so that's you know that's exciting, and we're really fired up about that. Um, and and there may be others in other sectors that, that want to be involved in that. It might be you know a banking sector or 
know, a, some other consultancy sector or a real estate sector or something like that, because all of these sectors are running off pencil and paper information. You go and buy, if you go and buy a property in the Western District of Victoria or anywhere, oh, it's got 10,000 acres and look at the swimming pool. Well, that's great, but like, where's the production information? What does it cost me per hectare? What am I getting in return? That doesn't exist. Um, you know, there's a whole industry in itself that, that's looking for this information. Uh, the education industry is, is using textbooks that have information that, that's not necessarily up to date either. Um, if we're educating the people coming through to drive this industry forward and, and we're not using or talking about the latest tools or, or the latest information, real-time information, then we should be doing that. So there's an opportunity there. Uh, and I think you can look across any sector that's involved in this, you know, the supply chain sector. Information is going to an abattoir and a lot of the time it might not be getting back to the, to the farmer. And the farmer's doing all this effort to build a product to get a product out the door and then they see some money come in but they have no idea at this point generally on, you know, the quality of the meat, the yield of it, you know, all of those kind of factors that are important in in getting a price on the other end, but the farmer doesn't know how to, how to do that because they're not getting that information to flow. And then if you go right down to the consumer end, there's a drive from a consumer point of view more and more to know what they're eating, and, and that dot's not being joined either. I mean, in some cases, you walk into a supermarket in Japan, and you can like pull up a cryback steak and, and basically scan the barcode, and it will come up with the farmer's face from the Riverina. You know, um, it's, it's possible and achievable is it, is it to scale? No. Can it be? Yes. How do we do that? Well, you know, there's a few things that need to happen on the way. Um, getting back to the, you know, the Bayer thing, I think that there's opportunity on the ground level and there's a lot of opportunity for us in terms of exit strategies. Um, is it you know, it's too early to be having those conversations, obviously, now and thinking about it? But, um, you know, from our point of view as well, it's Exit strategies are always always nice, but but you know we have a, a group of people that's excited about not just building a, a record keeping tool, but maybe it is that supply chain transparency. Maybe it is this. Maybe it's the next thing. And if I'm not doing this, well, I don't, there's nothing else I want to be doing. So you know I have no reason to go anywhere. But you know the reality of investors and people, you know, putting their money in want exit strategies and 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 want you know. A light at the end of the tunnel, so that's stuff that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, so, I mean, for the last, um, broadly speaking, um, we gave away sort of around 20% for the for the three million. So we were tracking at around a 10 million valuation for that. Um, so we've got, you know, obviously investors have have equity. Um, but everyone in the business has, has equity. The, the, the way we do it is, you know, obviously there's smaller pieces of the pie over time, um, but everyone that comes to work with AgriWeb, we want, you know, people to have skin in the game and feel part of it. So, um, so you know, we have an employee option scheme that allows people to, you know, they hit milestones or they, you know, prove their worth or whatever it might be, then, then they, can, they can have options and, um, and, and drive the business forward because as we know in the startup world it's not a 9 to 5 and if it's a 9 to 5 then, then everyone fails and it's um, been fun but not really fulfilling so. Have you had any issues around data sovereignty or who owns the data? Not, not, not really, I mean we get, um, the, the way it works is the customer owns the data, we have a license to use it, um, we plan on using it in, in an aggregate format to do benchmarking tools and, and some other kind of you know use of the big data concept where other industries have used it. Um, it pops up not very often, but when it does pop up, it's it's well, what are you doing with my data? And and it's not it, it's more about oh well, I'm not familiar with what should be happening with it. I've just heard somewhere that you've got to be careful, but I don't know why. Um, and then when you explain, well, actually, if you do want to leave AgriWeb. You can export it all by pressing a button and run off into the sunset with the spreadsheet data, and that's fine. Um, but what we're looking to do with it is, is just like we're trying to drive your business forward, we're trying to drive the education industry forward, we're trying to drive the banking industry, or whatever it might be, you know. And that can happen through 
aggregated, large scale information. And if everyone can benefit, well, that's a good thing. Um, and if you paint that picture, then, then that makes sense. Now, sure, there's some people that just, I don't like the cloud, I hate the cloud, what's happening with my data, there's that, right? And then I say, well, do you have a bank account? Well, well you're in the cloud, I'm sorry, but you're in the cloud. Um, but it, it, a lot of it is education and, and awareness on, on that as well. Um, so you know, we, we can do more as an industry to, to help, help that. But, but, you know, I don't think it's, I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, people aren't stupid, farmers aren't stupid. In fact, they're extremely intelligent and multi-skilled. They know that it could be valuable, but at the end of the day, nobody cares about your stocking rate. Nobody cares about what you, know, what you did there. What people care about is, well, actually, in this region, who's shearing at this time? Well, in this region, what's being used here? That's valuable. We can then, we can then do some things um, that can add some value. So, yeah. <coughs> Any more questions or we'll wrap it up for this evening? All right. John, well, thank you very much for coming no on tonight. Actually, I do have something to do with you. Being a South Australian lad, I've got a oh, nice great. job from the Clear Valley. Great. So thank Thanks you very, very much for coming on tonight. Thank you. That was a, uh, it's, look, it's a fascinating journey that you, you've been on and it's an amazing product. And uh, looking forward to seeing you know, how the company and the products yeah, grow in the future. So thanks very much for coming along. No tonight. worries.